This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1155. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And uh, it is 79 Fahrenheit, 26C, kind of warm and muggy today. Uh, but we got our first rain in weeks yesterday into, into the night, and um, that certainly helps. Uh, things are turning green again already, so that's nice. 23C and cloudy, 74%. Yeah, it's rather humid, but feels like fall is finally here. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi there. Um, so it's 92 degrees. <laughs> uh, I pasted a little thing into the uh, show notes here. That is the 12 seasons of Texas. Uh, and we are, uh, according to my reckoning, in actual fall, having been through false fall, which was a few weeks ago, and then second summer. <laughs> uh, I think this might be it, though I could be fooled, because um, we're looking at uh, this morning. It was like uh, mid sixties outside, which is a which is a relief for us. And I'm looking at, I don't see looking down two weeks any forecast for any morning temperatures over about sixty five. Even though for the next week it's still going to be ninety degrees and above, and then we get into genuine real fall. <laughs> in the middle of October. It's still, you know, high 80s, so it's not fall for you guys, but it's fall for us. Amazing. There you go. That's the way it goes, the weather. That's the way it goes. Well, if you enjoy these conversations, weather, science, other things, we'd love to have your support. Microbe.tv slash contribute. We don't do ads on these programs to keep you focused, and we, we need your support to uh, to do them and you know your donations at least in the US are federal US tax deductible. A couple of uh, news items today there was a very nice review article in Clinical Microbiology Reviews. Masks and respirators for prevention of respiratory infections a state of the science review. So what they do here is they review over 100 other studies um, and reviews, and come to some conclusions, and they're very nice. I mean, you know, many of the mask studies, some of the mask studies are equivocal, right? Yeah. And so people jump on that, and they say, aha, you see, <laughs> it doesn't work. But if you look at the whole picture, as they've done here, they say there is strong and consistent evidence for airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. Second, if masks are correctly and consistently worn, they're effective in reducing transmission of respiratory diseases and show a dose response effect. Third, respirators are more effective than medical or cloth masks. And fourth, mask mandates are effective in reducing community transmission. Uh, a few other things that are interesting. Sixth, while there is much evidence that masks are not generally harmful, there may be some populations that can't wear them. In particular, they say people who have hearing disabilities. Uh, who have to look at people's lips, right? That could be a problem for them. And so the conclusion is we propose an agenda for future research, um, improved characterization of when masking should be recommended or mandated, and um, helping develop novel materials maybe for better masks. So a nice positive spin on masking. Yes. So uh, you, uh, in the... You've just talked about the primary article, and we'll also have in the show notes a link to uh, basically a report on this that is yep. uh, reader friendly. Okay, that all that well, there'll be a link to the primary article as well. Yeah, so there, there is a <clears throat> reader friendly version at Newfield Department of Primary Care Health Services. It's entitled "Comprehensive Review Confirms Mask Effectiveness Against Respiratory Infections, Urges Better Design and Policy Support." Yeah, because, you know, you need to have uniform support for this. You can't have some states saying you don't wear masks and others 
Well, yes, and, a, okay. and a huge problem early in the pandemic was um, implementing a mask mandate and then nobody can get masks. Yeah, that too. Which is not a very productive thing to do when people are already pretty freaked out that, you know, there are, there are morgue trucks parked in the streets of the city and now you're telling them they need something they can't get in order to yeah. avoid ending up in one. And uh, yeah, a lot of missteps there. But well, good to know that we... We didn't have this sort of data either that you could uh, point to and say, look, we have a history here and they are effective. So there were, there were legitimate questions, I think, you know, about how effective it might be. Uh, Now we can start uh, a a little uh, more, a little further ahead of the curve. Should we have this trouble again? The other thing that I've noticed traveling and being around is that the sort of cultural in, in this country where it could have been a problem. The cultural stigma of mask wearing, as far as I can tell, has gone away. Okay, so people wear masks or don't wear masks, and and nobody nobody gives it a second thought. Yep. I still I still see quite a few people masking. Yeah, which is good. Yeah, yeah you know it's it's up to you now. You have to decide in your circumstance yeah. what you want to do. Uh, we also have a case of eastern equine encephalitis virus in upstate New York, Ulster County. In fact, a fatal case. And that is uh, it's pretty rare. The last one in New York was in 2015. And this year there have been 10 cases <clears throat> so far. Mosquito-borne illness. And um, we talked about these viruses and these illnesses on TWIV 1145, hoofbeats and heartbeats. Um, and so, yeah, this is this is a rare infection. There's no vaccine um, because it's so rare, but you have to try and avoid mosquito exposure. Easier said than done. <laughs> yeah, they have some precautions here. You know, long sleeve, tuck your tuck your pants into your socks. Um, use insect repellents. Use screens. Eliminate standing water. Clean out your gutters. Yeah. Change water in bird baths twice a week. So this is the high risk season here for, for this and also West Nile virus, another mosquito borne virus. So be careful, folks. Most people do not develop symptoms. But when you do, fever, headache, vomiting, seizures, behavioral changes. I was looking for a case fatality rate. That's probably hard to define given that there's a lot of asymptomatic. Well, if you're asymptomatic, you're not a case, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, so somewhere it was about 30%. Yeah, I thought it was pretty high. It's quite high, yeah. And sometimes they have them in Massachusetts, right, Alan? Yeah, yeah, it can be. It can be here. It can be throughout the throughout the East, Eastern equine encephalitis. Yeah, yeah the name reflects horses. the fact that horses can be... Yep. Infected. I mean, this virus has a reservoir in wild animals in in nature, uh, and they transmit it among mosquitoes. Transmitted among them, but occasionally those mosquitoes will bite a person or a horse, and they can get very sick. And um, in those situations, they're dead end. They don't spread from the horse or from the person to another. There actually is a horse vaccine <laughs> for triple E. Because uh, horses are expensive. <laughs> yes. Do you know what yeah, that and vaccine? also, you know, if you vaccinate your horses, that's fewer mosquitoes flying around carrying triple E because one less reservoir. Do you know what the horse vaccine consists of? I don't. EEE horse vaccine. But we can find out quickly. Hmm. A core vaccine. What does that mean? A core vaccine. It's ninety percent mort- mortality in horses, by the way. Oh, that's Ooh. a big problem. Yeah, birds can have it. Uh, can carry the virus as well. Core vaccine sounds like maybe a subunit vaccine. Yeah, it could be. <clears throat> but don't know. It's you know, not, the, uh, not a familiar vaccine terminology term. <laughs> Uh, a lyophilized, inactivated, adjuvanted whole virus. Oh. oh. I don't know what makes that a core vaccine, though. Yeah, I don't know what that well, is. Well, it's a new word. Or is that a term used maybe to yeah. indicate this is one of the main vaccines that you oh, give your horses? Okay. 
maybe. So there you go. You grow. It's grown in primary chicken fibroblast cell cultures. It's inactivated with formalin, and then other things are added. That sounds like a pretty annoying manufacturing process. Yeah. Mm. You got to keep isolating new primary cells from chickens? My guess is that that's a loose <laughs> definition of primary. I'll bet you that's, it's, I mean, real primary, right, is a chopped up embryo spread yeah. out on a Petri dish. Yeah. But people sometimes, you know, uh, get uh, primary cells out of that and then harvest them and even, mm -hmm. uh, even passage them a couple of times and then freeze them down into aliquots. So they're not genuinely primary but they're close and you can i mean i'm guessing i'm totally guessing here but uh that would be a lot of chick embryos to hassle with uh as you For production yeah that's, yeah that's a pain yeah you can you can easily make them from embryos but at that scale it would be yeah a pain yep okie dokie on to the literature our snippet today we actually mentioned this some time ago, it's an article in Nature. Farmed fur animals harbor viruses with zoonotic spillover potential. And um, one, two, three, four, five, oh, six. The, yeah, so the authors, I think it's best <laughs> if we just read the footnote on these because there are so many and they overlap. Uh, contributing equally <laughs> is Jin Zhao, Wenbo Wan, Kang Yu, Philippe Lemay, John H. O. Peterson, Yu Hai B, Eddie Holmes, and then jointly supervising the work, Yu Hai B, Eddie Holmes, Wan Ting He, and Shuo Su. And I note that we're talking about laboratories in China, Belgium, Sweden, Australia, and the U.S. A very international collaboration. Very multinational effort. Yep. Okay. As you know, Many a zoonotic virus is one that comes from an animal to a human, and we just talked about one eastern equine encephalitis virus. It's a zoonotic virus because every human or horse infection comes from some wild animal source, and um, we don't really do great surveillance to know all the animals out there that could harbor viruses that could affect us. You know, we talk about. Uh, market animals, which we will talk about in our second paper. Um, we talk about farm animals like pigs and cows. Uh, but um, and, and they say there's a lot of focus on conventional livestock. But here they focus on animals that are farmed for fur. So these right. are not domesticated animals. They're wild animals, but they are farmed. That's right. And You'd be amazed at the range of animals that are used for fur. It's a zoo. Yeah. We got rodents, like muskrats, nutria, and guinea pigs. We have carnivores, mink and foxes, even told ungulates like deer. Amazing. So I the hadn't question... thought of deer being used for fur. I thought of no, them as more of I. a leather source, but okay, they are farmed. Yeah. And so the question is, what, what viruses do they have? Do they pose a risk? And that's what this paper is about. And you know that you've heard that there have been outbreaks in mink, right? The, um, the mink were infected with SARS-CoV-2 early on, farmed mink. Uh, and H5 they even N1. passed it from mink to mink, mink to and mink. back yep. to humans, right? That's right. There have been outbreaks of H5N1 influenza A virus in, in mink. And of course, if you farm these animals, humans are in contact with them. So there's your opportunity for viruses to go uh, from one to the other. Humans are in contact with them, and they are in much closer proximity to each other than they would be in the wild, particularly the carnivores. Mm -hmm. the, the rodents sometimes live in you know, little colonies, but um, you, you don't see mink hanging out in a herd. Um, so the, so it's a whole, the setting is conducive to spreading virus between animals and also to spillovers into humans. Now, what they did here, first of all, Asia, 
is a, is a very active region for fur farming and trading. So they, and in particular, they sampled uh, farmed and wild fur animals across China. And what they did was they sampled individual organs of animals who, who died, who had died, uh, probably from infectious diseases, um, which is different from what one would usually do. It would be to pool organs or pool samples from animals. But here they kept each one individual. So well, you could tell where it was from. And this is a lot more work. I mean, that's one of the reasons this is a nature paper is that um, you know, if you're going around taking taking fecal samples and pooling them, that's uh, a couple of 96 well plates or whatever. Uh, and that's important work to do to get a survey. But here, taking all these individual animals, and it's a lot. It's a lot of different species. It's a lot of different individuals from each species. And then taking them apart by taking the ones that have died of something so you mm. you enriched your sample for likely virals viral uh you know sequences and and then taking them apart and um sequencing individual organs they divide these animals into two groups they have the main farmed fur animals and then multi-purpose other farmed fur animals so the main one and you have four species uh carnivora that are farmed only for fur and not for food consumption. These include mink, red fox, arctic fox, and raccoon dog. This and is in- something I'm going to mention again on our second paper because I actually read them in the in the other order. I read the main paper first and then the snippet paper. Um, and I was struck by the fact that the raccoon dog turns up in the other paper in a setting where I wouldn't expect a fur animal to be. Yeah. So, but we can talk about that when we get to it. Yeah, it's a good point. So from these four species, they had 164 individuals, and most of them came from four provinces that have intensive breeding programs. And the other 48 were from six other Chinese provinces. Now, for the multi-purpose animals, these are bred for food, traditional medicine, and fur. They sampled 297 animals. 24 species, um, carnivora, artiodactyla, rodentia, diprotodontia, and lagomorpha. And of uh, these 461 fur, um, 412 were from breeding environments and 49 uh, from wild sources. And so they they had... They took samples based on clinical signs, respiratory gastrointestinal disease. So they would collect lung and intestinal tissue. They would make, um, they had 697 tissue samples, 441 from intestines, 255 from lung, and one from liver, and made DNA libraries from each of these and uh, then sequenced them. Okay, so what did we find? <laughs> Viruses. Lots of viruses, 125 probable vertebrate-associated viruses encompassing 101 species of RNA viruses from 16 families. All the usual subjects, uh, we'll, we'll talk about them, but include coronaviruses, caliciviruses, picornaviruses, etc., and 24 species of DNA virus from four families Anelloviridae, adenoviridae, circoviridae, and parvoviridae. And the most abundant in the lungs were viruses from paramyxoviridae, coronaviruses, and caliciviruses, and then from the intestines, coronaviruses, rheoviruses, and astroviruses. Makes sense. Most of the fur animal species had between two and 23 uh, associated species. Now, remember, these are genomes, right? They don't have infectious virus, so always a caveat. Between two and 23, mink had 23 (laughs) vertebrate-associated viruses from 11 families. Raccoon dogs had 19. Guinea pigs had 20. Arctic foxes had 13. Now, if it sounds like a lot, you'd get similar numbers from people. Yes. If you ground up but organs. But interestingly, um, 
a lot of these are are viruses known known viral sequences, but they weren't known to infect these animals. Right. So a lot of them are. Uh, this expands the host range that we thought we knew of these viruses, um, and then they have a bunch of viruses that appear to be novel that haven't been seen. Right. So uh, co-infection is very common, as I, as I said. However, 126 animals, they didn't find any viruses. I'm very surprised, actually, that they wouldn't find them, right? Because everybody has a virus. <laughs> so I don't know what that's about. They don't really comment on that. And as Annalyn said, that most viruses are evolutionarily closely related to circulating viruses, but they got divergent lineages and, and various uh, in in the uh, Siberian weasel, they found the weasel fenui like virus. <laughs> I like that name. Um, Thirty six virus species from twelve families were considered to be novel, and mostly the novel ones are from the Picornaviridae, Caliciviridae, and Circoviridae. But they found others as well. Now, they also found viruses that are associated with human infection. For example, hepatitis E virus was found in samples from rabbits and raccoon dogs. A hep E virus is a gastrointestinal infection that um, humans get from these kinds of meats. Hmm. So that makes sense. They found from, Japanese from rabbit meat, um, maybe, yep. but we're told that they don't. That people don't eat raccoon dog. It's for fur. Okay. Japanese encephalitis virus was found in a, a guinea pig. Uh, Rio viruses were found in Eurasian red squirrels and raccoon dogs and guinea pigs, mink, uh, and also several diarrheal pathogens of humans were found in animals, norovirus, uh, rotavirus among them. So um, that's those are viruses that can infect people. We see them in animals. Also, seemed to be a lot of cross species transmission. Uh, they found a virus, Geta virus, which is mainly in livestock, pigs and horses. They found it in a raccoon dog, so they can jump from one species to another. And some of these viruses had a broad host range, they could infect multiple uh, hosts. One of them was identified in seven animal species across China. That's a wide host range. It sure is. Okay, coronaviruses and influenza viruses. These are obviously very important. They found seven coronavirus species in 66 farmed animals. So that expands the host range of these uh, coronaviruses. And they say a particular concern was the identification of Pipistrellus bat coronavirus HKU5 like viruses in the lungs and intestines of two farmed mink. So bat coronaviruses. And mink. Okay, so you know it's a it's a wild thing out there. It's crazy. Yes, it's a wild, wild world. Uh, and they, they say the very high, and and then there were a couple of um, species where they found very high uh, levels of coronaviruses in the animals, um, and they're wondering if the fact the infection with those viruses caused the disease or caused the death because there was so much of that virus present. We also found a bunch of influenza viruses in these animals, H5N6, H1N2, H6N2. Um, and for one of these, it seems to have come from a human virus um, that went into an animal and then recombined in pigs and so forth. So a lot of um, cross-species infections and, and uh, gene swapping is going on out there. <clears throat> Okay, so then, which of these should we worry about? All of them? None of them? Some of them? I'm going to worry about all of them. I'm gonna, I think we <laughs> ought to worry, worry at least a little bit about all of them. So what they did is they said, we'll, we'll look at each virus and ask whether it has the potential to jump species barriers. So they identified 39 potentially high-risk viruses that seemingly frequently jumped host. Um, so in, including 11 zoonotic viruses. In other words, we've already seen those viruses in humans, and now we found them in an, various animals uh, in this study. 
um, 15 cross order viruses, not, not in humans, but in two or more animal orders. So that would give it a higher risk. And then 13 potentially high risk. Um, the virus comes from a genus which has other viruses that uh, are, are found in human. So the greatest number of risk viruses, 21, was found in the carnivora. Uh, and these viruses were found in different species from fur animals and so forth. You suppose that's because carnivores eat other animals? <laughs> yeah. I think so. Yeah, I think they're inherently at higher risk. Right. Uh, so um, 16 potentially high-risk viruses in the intestines, 8 in the lungs, and 14 in both tissues of the animals. Um, Eurasian red squirrels had a very high diversity and richness of potentially high-risk viruses, while raccoon dogs carried up to 10 potentially high-risk species, which was the highest. And so uh, raccoon dogs, mink, guinea pigs, rabbits, arctic foxes, we're all having uh, potentially high-risk viruses in them. High risk for transmission to humans, that is, right? Okay, that's basically it. 125 viruses, 20 virus families. Co-infection is commonplace. 11 zoonotic viruses, 15 viruses that transmit among mammalian orders. So they say, we should really be monitoring We ought to be looking closely. at this, yes. <laughs> But it's not easy, right? It's it's not trivial. I mean, I think you'd have to set up a, a screening program on every farm, right? Well, you could do know. since you, uh, this does this does shorten the list a bit. Instead of sampling all the animals for all the viruses in multiple organs, um, I think they have they have shown you know lung and intestine in animals that are sick and look at these viral genera. Um, you could probably develop some kind of assays for that. And since these are farmed animals, mm. you don't have the problem of collecting them if you have a robust regulatory regime where periodically people go around to the farm and sample sick animals. Yeah. I mean, well, they say we should focus on... Um... Mink, raccoon dogs, and guinea pigs, because they yeah. have the highest richness, right? And then, yeah, you need a sampling program. And then it would be useful to take serum from the workers and see if they're making antibodies against any yes. of these, right? Just, and I'll bet you find antibodies, right? So it would imply that these viruses are entering people, and you've got to keep an eye out for them, right? Yeah. The context I think of. Uh, that occurs to me as I consider this kind of study is I think about <clears throat> what's it called? CEPI. Mm -hmm. Yes. Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Initiative or something like that. Um, who's, it's a nonprofit organization whose mission it is to try and uh, put together uh, a collection of vaccines or vaccine candidates that have at least been through preclinical testing so right. that they're kind of ready to go uh, for potentially pandemic diseases. And the big question is, uh, you know, there's lots of viruses out there. What, what are the candidates? What are the most likely candidates? And it's exactly this kind of study that helps identify what those are. And there ought to be more and more and more of this stuff so that we know what the, uh, you know, m more nuanced perspective on the virosphere mm -hmm. other than just what's out there, but, you know, how transmissible are they amongst different species? What's their potential for spillover? Where do you find them? Blah, blah, blah. They, they also note that the, the influenza viruses that they detected in this study have been found in people. There have been cases of human infection with these viruses, uh, and, and many of them have contact with animals. So, you know, influenza viruses are quite diverse. They're in lots uh, of they're, animals. They're the champs when it comes <laughs> to this. Because the, the, uh, the 2009 pandemic virus, right, came from like three different sources, right? One of yep. which had been around since 
the 1918 flu, right? There was right. Uh, uh, genetic That's elements right. from 1918. And they're going back and forth and around from species to species. Yeah. Anyway, this is open access. You can, there's some nice maps here where you can see the distribution of yeah. all these. Was animals. this one open access? Or yeah, was. I think so. Uh, I'm not, not sure. I uh, I had my uh, privileges running. One of these when I was downloaded. not, and I think it might have been this one. Maybe it was this track. one. I could be. Yeah, I, I can. Seriously, yeah, this I, one. I can... This one is closed. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, so I I automatically get access through Columbia. I think. Okay, our paper also has to do with animals and, and raccoon this... dogs. And some of the same animals. Cell, cell, genetic tracing of market wildlife and viruses at the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic. And also, many, many authors uh, on this article. We have three corresponding authors, Christian Anderson, Michael Warby, and Florence Debar. And they're from University of Arizona, Scripps, University of Saskatchewan, University of Edinburgh, University of Sydney, UCLA, Erasmus in the Netherlands, Tulane, and other places too. Many of the usual suspects, yes. okay, <laughs> right. in, this, uh, in this sort of investigation. People we've talked to before, Robert Gary, Eddie Holmes, Marion Coupons, Co Koopmans. Koopmans. Uh, um, right. So... And they've been on TWIV, including yeah. Christian Anderson, Michael right. Warby. First author is Alexander Kritz Christoph. So this continues in the story of trying to understand the origins of SARS CoV 2. And as you know, and we've talked about endlessly, but not enough apparently, the Wanhan Seafood Market in Wuhan was the, had the site of the earliest known cases. Most of the earliest worked at or visited that market. And this link was made very early on by clinicians throughout the city. And then studies after the fact, uh, which we have discussed previously on TWIB, uh, showed that there are 174 patients with onset of illness in December 2019. 32% of them had a link to the location, uh, which it's not just coincidence in a city of over 12 million yeah, 12 people. Yeah, 12 million people. This is one of four, only four live animal markets in the city. And a third of the initial cases have direct links to this market. And if you map the cases, the early cases who didn't have a direct link, it paints a bullseye on the market. They live near it. Right. So uh, uh, I'm sure that all of our listeners... You can probably say all in this case. All of our listeners are aware of the fact that the uh, origins of uh, SARS-CoV-2 have been in the minds of some at least controversial. Uh, and this goes back and forth in the popular press. And there, uh, uh, many will be aware of the fact that there was a recent burst of activity in the press uh, with headlines uh, uh, of new. Uh, investigations in support of the notion of the origins of SARS-CoV-2 in the market. This paper that we are going to discuss is the paper that caused that most recent burst. So if you're curious uh, from reading the news about uh, what was, what, what is going on there, this is the relevant paper. Yeah. And this is thankfully open access. Yeah. So just to summarize a little bit more before we dive into this paper, what we know, um, there were very few human infections before the earliest market case, which was December 10th. And the most common recent ancestor of the virus is estimated to be either late November or early December 2019. There's no evidence for any circulation before November. Many people say, oh, it was circulating in October and July. No. You would There's see no... that you would see that in the genome in the early cases. You would see yeah. evidence of it having circulated in humans, and you do not. Yeah, and they say surveillance and retrospective testing have found no evidence of substantial community transmission prior to December 2019. So, people who bring up all other scenarios of earlier, no, there's no evidence for any other transmission. 
the earliest sequences of the virus belong to two lineages, which are called A and B. And both lineages, as, as you'll see in a bit more, were found in the market. And that's consistent with two independent spillovers from animals to people uh, in the market. And this is a key aspect of support for the market origin, that there were probably more spillovers, but we detect the two of them in these two lineages. And we know that when you get a spillover that actually spreads in humans person to person, it is in, in all, many cases, probably in all cases, it is the result of multiple spillovers that happened before and finally something got settled into the human population. Right, right. Yes, yeah, it's usually not one. No, it's not. It's it, not efficient. So in, in February of 2020, China banned uh, the sale of wildlife for human consumption. And the same thing happened after after SARS-1 in 2003. And there's, there are many parallels, of course, between the two outbreaks. SARS-1 was first found more than a thousand kilometers from its closest bat relatives in Yunnan province and, and was linked to the wildlife trade. So the, the virus was found in the wildlife markets of Guangzhou and the closest viruses were a thousand kilometers away. Um, and months later, so many many open many markets were left open in SARS one, uh, and so they could find viruses in animals months after the SARS one outbreak. In particular, masked palm civets and common raccoon dogs. We found SARS one in those animals. Now, raccoon dogs, right? They're not supposed to be eaten, right, uh, Alan? <laughs> yeah, so this was, since I read this paper first, and I hadn't really paid much, I, I knew that was one of the species that was a candidate for this, and I had seen the earlier paper on this, um, which was using the same samples, by the way, and we'll talk about the sampling in a moment. Um, but uh, I hadn't really given it much thought until I saw in the snippet paper today what they said, raccoon dogs are only farmed for fur. And I looked, I looked it up, and I can't find anything about raccoon dogs being eaten or, you know, used for anything but fur. Um, I, I tried finding recipes. All I found was, like, recipes for raccoon, you know, which I knew about. <laughs> I, I had an uncle who used to hunt uh, raccoons. This, sorry, that sounds kind of rich kind of redneck and and it is anyway um <laughs> so this this species and by the way raccoon dogs are not raccoons or i guess they're closest to dogs they're closest to foxes um but uh these were apparently there were there were cages of them in the huanan seafood market and we know that for sure um that's there's photographic evidence from uh, i think as late as 2019 of right this species being sold there um, and I'm, I'm perplexed, uh, cause I, I don't think of fur as something that you, it's not like lobster where you go and pick out the one you want. And, uh, I don't think, um, mm -hmm. and it certainly doesn't strike me as a, as a DIY thing where you, they give you the pelt and you go home and make your own. No. So I, I don't know what the, maybe this was like a business to business. That's deal. the only, that's, well, that's one thing I can think of. There may be other. Other reasons for having a raccoon dog that we haven't considered. Mm. Uh, but yeah, business to business might make sense. As if this were, you know, wholesale for raccoon yeah. dogs. Anyway, this one on market, the biggest in terms of wildlife vendors in Wuhan, uh, they were illegal. It's known that they, are, they were illegally selling uh, animals like raccoon dogs, civets, bamboo rats, porcupines, hedgehogs. Badgers in the fall of 2019, and that's because after SARS one, uh, the the sale of those animals in uh, markets was banned. Right, right, that's correct. But if there's a market, somebody's going to yep. sell it. Yeah. And, and the other thing that you've already alluded to, Vincent, was <laughs> that very shortly after uh, it became apparent that there was a pandemic and that the market might be the source. They closed down the market, cleaned it up, got yeah. rid of all the animals. Uh, now, the cynical out there 
might look at that as an attempt to destroy the evidence, okay? But uh, if it's me, and I think that I've got a facility that is uh, spewing out pandemic viruses, I'm going to want to clean it up. Uh, but it uh, makes the uh, retrospective analysis more That's difficult. Right. Okay. Yeah, and particularly in light of what Vincent just said about the 2003 SARS-1 outbreak, where they didn't close down the markets for months, and that's why we know exactly where SARS-1 came from, because people could go in afterwards and check and get samples from the same places. Um, and the Chinese government learned from that because they widely were widely panned for having mishandled the SARS-1 outbreak, and they did a much, much better job this time, um, and said, okay, we got a similar situation. We should have shut down the market in 2003. Let's do what we should have done then. Um, and I think everybody in the public health community and the virology community was in favor of this move, because that's, of course, what you would do, as Rich just said. So this... Um the the market was closed on January first, twenty twenty, as Rich said. Um, most of the wildlife vendors were in the West Wing. <laughs> okay, that's going to be important, as you can see here. And after the market was closed, some environmental samples were taken. We'll give you some details on that in a moment. Uh, and those were uh, analyzed by PCR and genome sequencing. And the data were made public. <clears throat> and this paper takes those data, the raw data, the sequence data and does very detailed analysis of it and what we can get out of it. And there are, there are a number of things we're going to learn. Let me summarize them ahead of time. First, they find that the most recent common ancestor of the virus within the market is the same as the ancestor for the pandemic as a whole, right? So if you're saying the market is the start, that makes perfect sense. Then they look at the data um, of the, uh, the sequence. They can, they can tell what animals were there by mitochondrial DNA uh, sequences, and they can know what, what species are present, um, and even where they were in China at the time, as we'll see. They identify other viruses in these environmental samples. So these, these animals, they, they identify SARS-CoV-2, of course, but they also identify other viruses showing these animals were shedding viruses in general, known viruses uh, of, of these animals. And so this puts together a very nice picture of what was present at the market and when and uh, can lead to some other studies. As and some see. of those other viruses were specific for those animals, correct? That's so correct. it's not like it's humans spreading those viruses and contaminating animal samples. That's right. So that... Yeah. that uh, um, reinforces the notion that this kind of sampling can pick up a, an infected animal. And the, the sequence data that they're analyzing, so this is entirely a sequence analysis paper. They don't have any new samples. Right. Uh, what this is doing is a much deeper dive into the data from the market that were published by a Chinese group, Liu et al., they give the reference. Um, and that paper was all about, or that that release was all about the samples from the, um, you know, what samples were taken from where and looking at SARS-CoV-2. And here they're doing all this other analysis that um, Vincent just described. All right. So first of all, as, as they say, if the market is the origin, then the ancestor of the virus in the market should be the same as the ancestor of the pandemic. And so they basically find that the ancestor is the same. It's equivalent. The market ancestor is equivalent to that of the larger pandemic. They get actually, the way they do this is they have four nearly complete SARS-CoV-2 genomic sequences uh, from samples collected on January 1st. Um, these were uh, collected in the West Wing where most of the wildlife vendors were located. They find the two lineages here. They add in uh, sequences from early on in the in the pandemic uh, as well, and they use computational approaches to calculate the most recent common ancestor. And they say that the that the MRCA of SARS linked to the market is equivalent to the MRCA of the pandemic establishes that the timing of the origin of the market outbreak is genetically indistinguishable 
from the origin of the pandemic. So this is an important finding, right? Because we're saying this market event is significant. It's the beginning of the pandemic. Okay. Now, uh, more about the samples. This is this is more information that I, I, I learned before. It's good. The market was sampled at multiple times in 2020. On January 1st, it was sampled widely with um, mostly sampling stalls that had human cases. 515 samples uh, were tested. January 12th, 10 samples were taken from seven wildlife stalls um, and uh, other samples. In March, were from drains, sewage, stalls, and warehouses uh, uh, until March 2020. So they they looked at all of these sequences of virus. So they look at the virus sequences, SARS-CoV-2, and they ask, is it associated with specific stalls? So this is called a spatial relative risk analysis, right? And they say this the rate of positivity, but just by PCR, was unevenly distributed within the market. There is increased positivity in the Southwest sector. And one stall, stall A, stood out with a 30% PCR positivity rate. And I and think so, this stall was mentioned in the previous publication on these data, but I think it might have been called stall 29. Yeah, um, yeah, it has been mentioned. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's the same spot. It's the same location. So both by PCR and, and genomic sequencing, you find uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA in and around stall A. There's so actually some samples from the next stall over B, but it's less positivity uh, than in stall A. Um, and and then later sampling provides more additional support that stall A was a hot spot that we're. 60 samples from the drainage system collected on January 27th and 29th. Four of them were positive, uh, including the drain directly in front of stall A. 17 more drain samples were taken on February 9th and 15th. Three of them tested positive, again, in front of stool, small A. So three independent spatial signals that associate SARS-CoV-2 with uh, wildlife stall A. They also, as I said, sampled stall B and have some positivity there. And they also say something that's very interesting. In February, the off-site warehouse associated with this stall was sampled. And 5 of 12 sampled tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. I don't know exactly what that means. I guess this is where the animals were staged before they came to the market, yeah, you I'm, think? Yeah, I'm assuming that there's a farm facility where the animals are being raised, and then there's a warehouse of some kind or a facility where... They've got a bunch of them there, and then they take some to the market each day. Yeah, that was my assumption. Yeah. Now, other stalls have SARS-CoV-2 positivity, and these were where human cases were. So we know where the earliest human cases were in the market, right? And these positivities are associated with those locations. So it's human shedding, most likely, that results in. Uh, in those samples. Okay, so that's the first bit. We have southwest corner stall A, a hotspot for SARS-CoV-2. So one thing I want to mm. uh, point out here is that the, uh, tell me if I've got this right, but the PCR positivity for SARS-CoV, these, as you already mentioned, uh, Vincent, these samples are having are happening over a period of time. The PCR positivity rate decreases over that period of time, right. and that's because the RNA is labile, right. okay, yeah. and it and it tends to go away. And I'm thinking at the same time that the probably, I assume that the um, animal hits are DNA, mm -hmm. and yes. that would be more stable. Yes. It's correct. Yeah, the the animal hits are mitochondrial DNA, for yeah. example. Yeah. Yes, that's right. They're in the context DNA. of both of these things, though. This place is also being cleaned. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Just as part of the public health, I mean, you've right. got maybe a pandemic started here. We're gonna. I would bleach the place. I just. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Right. So January first, it's cleaned, and so there's no more introduction of virus at that time. 
And so that's why, as Rich said, the RNA is degrading slowly with time. So yeah. the positivity goes down in the later samples, right? Which is what you would expect. All right. So next they look at what kind of animals were present. So these, these uh, samples have nucleic acids from mitochondria, which can be used to infer the animal species. And so um, the five positive SARS-CoV-2 samples from stall A have DNA from raccoon dogs, hoary bamboo rats, dogs, and European rabbits. And then there were a few other samples in a, in a couple of them as well. And raccoon dogs, rabbits, and dogs are known to be susceptible to infection uh, with SARS-CoV-2. And raccoon dogs are capable of transmission, uh, and, and civet, civets as well can be uh, infected. Uh, next to stall A, um, there were also some positive samples with wildlife DNA. Uh, there was a garbage cart where raccoon dog DNA was detected and a stall with bamboo rat mitochondrial DNA. All five positive samples from stall A contain human mitochondrial DNA, but humans were not the most abundant mammals in any of these samples, right? So, you know, the, 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 there's some critics of this which say, ah, oh, there's human DNA in there. It's, how do you know it's the animals? Whether well, the animals are the, the majority of the, of the sequences. And in addition, the, the wildlife DNA is, is co-localized with uh, locations of the wildlife stalls. And the human DNA is di distributed throughout the market. So yeah, you can find human DNA in stall A, but you can also find it everywhere else, as you would expect, because there are people everywhere, but the wildlife is just in stall A. So I think that is a good counter to people saying, ah, human DNA is there, right? None of these arguments are airtight. But it's all adding up. It is all very, very consistent with a market introduction, and it is not at all consistent with the spillover having happened anywhere else. Yeah, it's not a perfect situation because the sampling was done after the market was closed and so forth. So, but with what we have, this is a remarkable set of conclusions that can be made. Yeah. Um, let's see. The, the big, the big question as you read this is if you have a sample that's got both viral nucleic acid in it and mm -hmm. animal nucleic acid in it does that mean that the animal had the virus or does it mean simply that those two things were on the same surface okay and you can't answer that conclusively right. but the uh, uh the way i read this the bulk of the evidence in terms of the frequency of association and the localization and everything else, argues for infected animals. Okay, it's not. There's not a smoking gun, as it were, but uh, the or a smoking the, raccoon dog, uh, right? Which is a nice image to have. <laughs> no, they they um, it's consistent with an origin there, yes. right? From an animal. Uh, I would go beyond consistent with. I would say the most parsimonious explanation. Yes, okay. yes, I would agree with that. Well, you know, evidence continues to emerge for the market origin. Yeah. It doesn't emerge for anything else, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and they they also find um, animal DNA from species that were not supposed to be there at all, like the masked palm civet. Right. Um, so this is all this is all fitting together. Uh, and they the, also, the I, the one of the things you mentioned before that I just want to reemphasize because because I'm just kind of. Uh, coming to terms with this as well, is the notion that if it were humans contaminating the market, that you would find a high correlation between human DNA and uh, right. uh, the viral DNA Correct. all over the market. But that's not what you see. You see human so, DNA all over the place and the viral DNA focused on these stalls where the animals were. Exactly right. And focused not just on these stalls, but on specific... In stall A, it was a cart, it was a garbage can, and it was a fur removal, hair feather removal machine, yep. which if this is human contamination, I would expect it to be in a lot of other places and maybe not on the feather Hopefully removal Hopefully not machine. in the feather removal. We're, we're not known for our feather removal needs other than feeding mm -hmm. an animal through it. They also do not find DNA of animals that were not supposed to be at the market. 
like minks and red squirrels, etc. Right, which is good it means tells you the, the the accuracy of this method, and they do not find evidence for any bat or pangolin genetic material. We know that SARS-CoV-2 like viruses can be in these in bats and pangolins. They were not at the market, so right. it came from some other animal. Some of the species that were at the market were illegal, but they hadn't been. But things like pangolin had not been reported at the market before, and here they don't find pangolin either. So it's all consistent with what what's previously been reported is what we see. Now they they address an issue that of criticism that others have made. There have been some other studies done on the same data, which conclude that the um, number of animal sequence reads negatively correlates with SARS-CoV-2. And they say, well, you can't really do this because the, 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 the nature of uh, metagenomic counts, you know, when you get a read for a virus, it's not, it's not, um, it's compositional, it's relative. And there are all kinds of biases that can affect it. And also, we have to remember that animal shedding of the virus should precede human shedding in this uh, scenario at the market. And that most of the stools were sampled 11 days after the, the human cases. So the, the, the RNA from non-human hosts has more time to decay than the human RNA. And so that could give that bias as well. And they say they emphasize that in the non wildlife stalls, the SARS CoV 2 RNA is probably shed by humans. And therefore, you cannot make correlations using these samples. You can't say, where do we find SARS CoV 2 RNA in general? No, you can't do that because of what I just said. Yeah. The humans are shedding it too. But if you look at it in terms of the Southwest stall A, then it makes perfect sense. Um, okay, what else here? Let's see. Hmm. You got the bit about where the, and this may be out of sequence relative to your plan here, Vincent, but where the oh, uh, viruses. Ra <laughs> raccoon dogs come from. Yes. Because there's this that. issue. You'll get to yes. that. Okay, fine. Yeah, we're getting to that. So they, the next thing they did was look at other viruses besides SARS-CoV-2 because these animals have their own specific viruses. And um, they can find them by looking at the genome sequences. So they found, um, for example, a raccoon dog parvovirus, a bamboo rat coronavirus, and a civet kobu virus. They could re reconstruct the whole genome of these viruses. And they're from the wildlife stalls showing that these animals were, were shedding viruses. Yeah, and those are viruses that are specific for those animals. Right. And the distribution, uh, the, the, the pictures, the graphics are really pretty cool. Right. Uh, the pictures of those distributions look uh, the same, essentially, as SARS-CoV-2. Where you find those animals, you find those viruses. So they also can um, make some inference about movement of these animals uh, by, by looking at these viruses. And what has been found outside of the market in, in wild animals. And they say this the, the data suggests that movement of infected animals from southern China to Wuhan could have occurred, and that could have been the conduit of emergence of SARS CoV 2. And this is a similar scenario as what happened as SARS 1 moved from Yunnan to Guangdong and Hubei provinces. So, one yeah, of and the that's what Rich here, was just no, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, one of the issues here is uh, okay. So uh, I think the idea really is that these market animals are an intermediate host. We're all thinking that the original spillover came from bats, all right? Mm. Uh, and so, uh, but the bats that harbor the most closely related viruses are uh, quite a distance away in southern China and Vietnam, et cetera. And so how did they get to the market? And the interesting thing here is that raccoon dogs, there are several different species that come from different places in China. And although they can't actually pin down exactly where the raccoon dogs uh, came from that were in the Hunan market, they are not the species that come from the north. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. 
<laughs> and there's a really the the uh you know for those who want to use this proximity thing as an argument against uh it being uh coming from uh the market this is uh exactly the same thing as is mentioned in the introduction with SARS-1 okay uh it originated uh mm-hmm. uh originated probably uh, actually definitely uh thousand or so miles from where the human outbreak human spillover happened yeah they do uh they they say that the um they this more detailed mitochondrial species typing is consistent with an origin of the raccoon dogs um in the market in central or southern china from which a viral transmission chain within the animal trade could have arisen after a spillover from a bat reservoir south of Wuhan. Um, so you can go and look and see if that's the case. That would be well, a good idea. And by the way, they also found among the viruses, Shad, they also found influenza viruses in the market. And we know that there have been zoonotic cases of H9N2 influenza virus. So there was not just SARS-CoV-2 in the market in 19, 2019. There was influenza virus as well. It didn't spill over and become anything, but it was there in some of those animals. So it's a place where, as they say, where potential wildlife hosts of SARS-CoV-2 were actively shedding other viruses, which is what you would expect. Okay, so that that's the story here. Um, they say, um, we we don't know where the virus came from, but we have some idea now what intermediate animals might have contained the virus in the market with species and subspecies re- resolution. And so they say we can um, look for them now, right? We should do some surveillance and uh, look for them and on farms where they're, where they're raised. Yeah. Um, and, you know, these hosts, uh, some of these hosts that are present, raccoon dogs, they're susceptible. They shed high amounts of virus. They can transmit. It was uh, the, the the raccoon dog was most commonly detected in among these species, and has the most SARS-CoV-2 positive samples. So um, it's a good candidate for one, and we should probably go out and and look where they came from and try and do some sampling. Right. Yep. Uh, like we did in the previous paper. That's right. Yes. So focused uh, uh, genetic and serological sampling of raccoon dogs uh, will, may shed light on the emergence, right? Yeah, that would be really good. And so I, do, I also the, like this sentence: any hypothesis of COVID nineteen's emergence has to explain how the virus arrived at one of only four documented live wildlife markets in a city of Wuhan's size at a time when so hu- few humans were infected. And they actually do the calculation and the timing here. Um, uh, I didn't highlight that, but um, essentially at the time, just based mm-hmm. on the timing of the infections, you have if, if it was introduced by a person who was, the spillover happened someplace else and they went to the market, it would have to have been a single infection of that person that then spilled over at the market into everybody else. And it's just not credible that that's how this happened. Also, the, they say there were two lineages, right? right? And there were, that, that is one of the most damning pieces of evidence as far exactly. as I'm concerned, is that two lineages pop up in the same spot. Uh, this is a spillover. Yeah. I mean, they, they, many people say, oh, a human brought it into the market. But no. two lineages, it's just... There would have been, you'd have to have two separate people go to the same market within a very short time period who had also just been exposed and no. They say the detection of lineage B and A both within and indirectly linked to the market implies that the virus most likely emerged there or its supply chain before the most recent common ancestor, by which time there would have been an estimated of just three people infected. So there's part of this that I don't fully understand. Is the mm-hmm. idea then that the uh, split from a common ancestor into those two lineages would have happened in the market. Two, it, two different spillovers. Two spillovers. Two different it spillovers. Would, right. Right. 
either to, in the market or immediately proximal to these, yeah. like somebody who works at the stall went to the warehouse to pick up a load of raccoon dogs, um, spillover happened, then they show up at the market with their, you know, raccoon dogs for sale who are also carrying it. It spills over into somebody else there, but it's very, very closely linked to this market. The, uh, they have a, a graphical abstract here that I find amusing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where, uh, they're the, the, uh, the graphical abstract tries to summarize the types of data that are in the paper, right. including pre-existing data. Okay. That, uh, we know that the virus infects certain animals. We know that the, uh, uh, epidemiologically, the uh, market was the center of things. That even within the market, there was a hot spot for the viral infection, and that there were both lineages. And then they have uh, several, uh, three other boxes um, talking about the new data, and that is the deep sequencing of these uh, um, samples and the phylogenetic analysis. And what's cool is that those four bits are represented as puzzle pieces okay yes yes <laughs> that then can the the they they aren't even connected puzzle pieces okay they're inviting you to connect the pieces or saying or implying that they will yes okay? very clever i also like this statement um getting back to you know multiple spillovers um the transmission so the idea is that an alternative idea is that a human came into the market and brought the virus right so that first of all there are two lineages so that would have to happen twice and they say the the introduction by a trader or uh, upstream of the market is further challenged by the probability that transmission chains dependent on a single human would yeah. likely go extinct while a sustained interface between animals and humans in a market is more likely to result in the establishment of an epidemic. That was the sentence I neglected to highlight. Yeah. That is the key that you, you know, th that's what's happening at the market. You're having sustained interface and that's what you need for a very rare event, a low probability event. Anyway, as Alan said, it doesn't, it doesn't um, prove it, but it is all consistent with the market origin and there is no other data. There are no other data for any other kind of origin. And this is a lot of stuff you have to explain away in very convoluted ways if you propose any other origin location. Right. As I read this and consider this whole issue over time, uh, I have lots of thoughts about the nature of the scientific method. Okay? Because... This is the scientific method on steroids. Uh, lots of times you can do an experiment and it's absolutely convincing, okay? But there are, you know, more often than not, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And you have to do a lot of different experiments, right? And then I think about issues like, and I, I question myself, am I biased? Okay, and then I think, yeah, okay? I'm always biased. In science, we call that a hypothesis. Yeah. Okay, you 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 have a hypothesis about what might or might not be true, and then you do uh, experiments. And if you're if you're honest about it, you do a whole load of controls that are designed to disprove your hypothesis. Okay, and so all of that applies to this, uh, and it's really very interesting as just an exercise in the scientific method. And, um, you know, this is important to discuss. Both papers yeah. are relevant to the pandemic. And uh, we're going to just keep giving you all the evidence that comes out. And I, uh, the, 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 the snippet, you know, is as important as anything else. This, yeah. yeah. You know, we keep wringing our hands and saying, what are we going to do? Well, we should be doing that. Okay. We should yeah. be going out and sampling a lot of stuff mm -hmm. okay, and trying to decide where the, where the problems might be. And it was, it's very good to see with the snippet that, um, you know, there are a whole bunch of researchers in China who are doing exactly the type of analysis that we need to do yeah. to get at this. Um, and, right. and they're approaching it open-endedly. Yep. Okay. 
Let's do a couple of emails. That, um, have, we just have a few. Uh, Alan, can you take that first one? Sure. Chris writes, Dear Twave team, it's 65 and sunny here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I just finished a run while catching up on Twiv, a podcast I, like so many others, discovered in January 2020 and have followed with devotion ever since. In last week's episode, Rich praised an emailer for weather, pedantry, and trivia. You've gotten the weather, and the trivia will be appended. Now it is time for pedantry. <laughs> in many episodes, especially recently, Twiv hosts have decried those who mix science and politics. As someone who studied the history and sociology of science in graduate school and wrote my thesis on the political manipulation of social media, I'm here to remind you that science is always already shot through with politics. There is no distinction between the two. When Vincent says that a genomic database should be free and open for use, that's a legal and moral claim, i.e. a political one. When we talk about allocating funding, prioritizing research, or delivering vaccines, these are all political decisions. They create the world we live in together, though the medium of science as an institution, through the medium of science as an institution and professional practice. I understand that you probably mean capital P politics, Republicans and Democrats, not lowercase p politics. But this too is a mistake. One reason we are in the situation we are in now is not that certain segments of conservative America are anti-science, it's that they are anti-science with a capital S. They are using the tools and frameworks of science, reviewing literature, observing evidence, etc., against the institutions of science with a capital S, as shown by Lee et al. in their careful ethnography of anti-vaxxers. <clears throat> Gives a link. The direct historical analog here is between the Catholic Church, where priests interceded as interpreters and experts on behalf of their lay audience, and the Protestant Reformation, where everyday people took the tools of textual interpretation into their own hands to contradict and contravene the Church. Galileo notwithstanding, it was the long-run inheritance of the institutions of the Church, abbeys and monks becoming universities and scholars, that structurally formed what we today consider science as a set of expert practices on behalf of a lay public, instead of things commoners can do for themselves. TWIV, of course, is committed to educating the public to think critically and scientifically, and therefore operate as actors. In this sense, it is a political act in the best sense. It is trying to educate rather than alienate the vast mass of ordinary people, who need to be mobilized as allies in a broader struggle not only towards technically correct answers, but a world worth living in. <laughs> Very best, Chris. P.S. For trivia, as promised, some of it pedantic too, for bonus points. Uh, the word file, as in the verb meaning to organize or the noun referring to a document, comes from the Latin philium for thread, or philum for thread, because when monks and scholars switched from scrolls to sheets of paper in the 15th century, but had not yet invented bookbinding, they used bits of string to keep pages in order, filed along a thread, gives the source. Next, spaces between words are a technology invented in the medieval era. Before then, texts were read aloud, so there were no spaces between words, since one simply sounded them out. Monks who had taken a vow of silence, however, needed to read the Bible silently, and so invented spaces in order to facilitate the then novel practice of silent reading, gives another <laughs> source. Next, the fact, meaning a statement authoritative truth, a statement of authoritative truth ascribed to experts that could travel across social and cultural contexts while retaining truth and meaning, was likely not invented until the 1500s in relation to both changes in material publication systems, sheets of paper or cards instead of scrolls, and the development of modern bureaucracies full of experts with data. Gives the source. Next, Street addresses were invented in Imperial Vienna to make it possible to draft men into the military, <laughs> because before then, in a large city, you had no way of making sure you'd visited every house to conscript their sons, gives another source. While everyone on TWIV, finally, while everyone on TWIV studiously says data are in the plural, as is the descriptive convention among most scientists, there's a very good and very pedantic prescriptivist <laughs> English argument that it should be data is, because data falls most cleanly into the category of mass singular noun, i.e. things that are measured, oil, wheat, gold, and not things that are counted, barrels of oil, bushels of wheat, bars of gold. 
Therefore, one might say, this data looks good, mass singular noun, but also say, there are 10 gigabytes of data in this study, plural units of the underlying mass singular. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Chris. Thank you very much. This is a wonderful bolus of uh, <laughs> of all of the above. The um, uh, how, how's this breakdown? We weather, weather, trivi weather head head and, and trivia. trivia. And I have to say that uh, listening to this, um, uh, I take home that Twiv hmm. is a uh, the equivalent in science of the Reformation, <laughs> right? Because we are making science accessible to the lay public without the intermediary priests of science. Yeah, I was I was raised Lutheran, so I'm a I'm a I'm a I have some knowledge about this. I, I was raised Methodist. I I get you. Yeah. yeah, I I think it's a good point. Yeah, we are we are political. We are so, a political act in the Bex. Oh, sense. yeah. And the other thing, it comes, we've discussed this recently too before. The two quotes that uh, stick in my mind one from Bob Chen, we've talked about this before. One from Bob Chen, which is that uh, public health is by definition a mixture of science and politics. Mm. Uh, and Peter Daszak, who said that when you cross science and politics, you get politics. Yes. <laughs> I think these are good arguments for, yeah, science being a s and politics being no distinction between the two. Yeah, at, which is important to keep in mind. You know, yeah. that's the point he's making. Yeah, I mean, the, Let's well, what I complain that. about is when Republicans and Democrats sure. use science to get votes. Right? Yes, yes, and I would I would add this institutionalization of science just in the past five hundred years or so um, is not the origin of science. A lot of people say, well, you know, science was invented mm -hmm. by dead white European men. No, science is as old as humanity. And this is, this is an argument I first came across in Carl Sagan's Demon Haunted World, and I thought he presented it brilliantly. When we were just some smart apes hunting wildebeest across the savanna, we were doing science. Yep. We were yep. observing and figuring things out and testing hypotheses and Instead of publishing, the result was your family got to eat. And that's the selective pressure that science comes from. This is as old mm -hmm. as humanity. And yes, anybody can do it, but you got to do it right. It occurs to me uh, with that description, Alan, that uh, by, by those criteria, humans are not the only creatures that do science. No, we are not. Hmm. Well, I appreciate, Chris, your your. Absolutely. Discussion yes. of science and politics. I, I look at it in a new way. Yeah. I really appreciate it. And Very I good. love the trivia. The trivia is great. <laughs> Rich, can you take the next one? Uh, Rich writes, Dear esteemed Twiv hosts, I thought your readers might like to hear of a herpes virus. <laughs> I'm sorry. A herpes virus found in Pacific oysters. Here we go. Here in the UK, Pacific oysters are an invasive species covering some of the rocky shores on the east coast of Kent. They are thought to have escaped from oyster farms and a real problem as the sharp shells can make walking on rocky beaches problematic, as well as denying rock space for other marine animals. Uh, I help with marine surveys and recently heard that the Pacific oysters have attracted a novel virus, oyster herpes virus 1. That's O-1, uh, which also impacts oysters on the west coast of the U.S. However, in our case, this virus may help as it only attacks Pacific and not the rarer native oyster. Mm. It reminds me of the quote, successful systems attract parasites. I'm, I'm channeling Dixon on that one. Uh, please carry on twiving. And he gives uh, links to this. Um, uh, virus hmm. of oysters very cool, cool. very cool <laughs> i uh presume uh, implied in his uh um uh, letter is that this oyster virus is actually pathogenic it actually makes the oysters sick or makes them go away yeah impacts oysters yeah 
So did, it what, could we did control some, the population, I guess. We did some other, was it a retrovirus of mollusks, even oysters, many, many moons ago? And I'm thinking Steve Goff. Oh, you're oh. thinking of the um, the clam cancer that spreads okay. from clam to clam. <laughs> the DNA goes from clam to clam, and it, and it causes the cancer. Okay. <laughs> It's like a leukemia of of, uh, of clams. Listen, yeah, yeah. you got to have a sense of humor to, <laughs> to yes. really appreciate this of stuff. Of course. Um, last one is from Steve. Kathy's email doppelganger. Okay, so Kathy says so someone out there has her name and she gets her email and this is a problem. So uh, Steve says, if university IT will not help with your deadbeat email doppelganger, then take matters into your own hands. Email large attachments to its address. Until the inbox is full, either IT will then be forced to take action, or at least future emails erroneously addressed to it will bounce. <laughs> Maybe Kathy will see that. That's pretty cool. That's good. Thank you very much. All right. Time for some picks of the week. Rich, what do you have for us? Okay. I have three related sites. They're related because uh, the same umbrella organization uh, does all three of them. Uh, one is called immunize.org, the other is called vaccineinformation.org, and the other is called the National Network of uh, Immunization Coalitions. I don't think we've done this uh, these before. I just no. ran across immunize.org recently because, and let me see if I can find this again. Uh, well, I, uh, it's buried in here somewhere. When I want to know what a vaccine, anytime I hear about a vaccine, I want to know, is it a subunit vaccine? Is it a killed virus? Oh, sorry. An inactivated virus? Is it a live attenuated virus? Blah, blah, blah. What's in it? Okay. And the, what I do is I go looking for the package inserts for the virus because any drug that you get has this packaging insert that the, FD, the FDA uh, mandates be there, and they have a formula for putting, uh, for putting these together, and I've learned how to read them, so that you can get down, I know how far to scan down to get to the description, right? And I, recently looking for packaging inserts, I found that in a subdomain of this uh, site. Uh, oh, here it is. Under official guidance, FDA, you can click FDA, uh, and there's under that is package inserts and EUAs, and there they are. Yep, all of the package inserts for the commercially available vaccines. Hmm. Holy cow! And if you go to the home page of this uh, same site, immunize.org, immunize.org is really formulated for healthcare professionals. Okay, uh, but I think you know lay people who are deep into this. Uh, mm. would be very, uh, very interested in this because, you know, even on the, uh, basically the, uh, pretty much the top of this vaccines A to Z lists all of the, um, uh, vaccines that, uh, are prescribed, uh, and you can click on any one of them and get a whole bunch of information about that vaccine. And there's a whole bunch of other, uh, resources here. Um, that's so that's immunize.org. Vaccine immuniz uh, vaccineinformation.org is the same organization and the same sort of material, but formulated for uh, the lay public. Okay, so it's much easier to read. Uh, it's not as there's not as much stuff to slog around in, and it's very good. Uh, and then the National Network of Immunization Coalitions is basically a an aggregator of uh, uh, various organizations that do this kind of thing, okay? Uh, immunize, promote vaccines, and et cetera. And it's a place you can go. So these three sites together, and for me in particular, immunize.org, are really a great resource for understanding vaccines. That's great. I've actually done good. some work for some of these people. Hmm. Um, and uh, several years ago, we had um, LJ Tan on the show. You can mm -hmm. search the, the TWIV archive. He's one of the key people um, at immunize.org who's you know, very closely associated with this, and he organizes the annual, um, uh, what used to be called the Influenza Vaccine 
conference. It's now the adult and influenza vaccine conference. Um, so yeah, I know these folks. Good stuff. Yep. There he this is was, on the yeah. people page. Yep. This was founded uh, by a woman named Deborah Wexler. Yes. Uh, 30 years ago. Hmm. Um, who, you know, was interested in, uh, you know, making this sort of stuff, uh, available and it blew up. Cool. No, it's good to have this at one place. I yeah. love it. Great. Alan, what do you have for us? I have, um, a site I thought was really cool. It's called Birdcast. Um, <laughs> So this is this is one of these places where you can put in your address or any address any um you know location and find out some interesting stuff. And in this case what you're finding out is how many birds flew over your house last night. Well, not necessarily over your house, over your county. Um so it is a it's tracking migrations. Um and for the night of uh well for tonight uh, it's predicting uh, 515 million birds will be <laughs> flying on migrations across the United States. Um, it overlays that on the, the main map with precipitation, um, and you can see by the intensity of the migration where the main routes are for this time of year. So right now, a lot of the birds are flying south for the fall. Um, and I discovered that uh, something like 161,000 birds flew south on their migration over my county last night. Wow, that's a lot Which of is birds. The scale of this and the stuff that's migrating. I mean, we, I hear the geese, right? You can't miss the geese. Um, but everything else, it's like these little birds that are flying <laughs> long distance, little sparrows and stuff that are going long distances. And they're, they're um, you know, flying over in the night because a lot of them, most of them migrate in the... Uh, in the nighttime hours. How, so, how do they collect these data? <laughs> I, so I'm not entirely sure where this is all coming from. It's a big, big effort. If you scroll down to um, the partners, um, UMass Amherst is one of the partners, uh, Cornell Ornithology Lab, which is huge in, in this field, Colorado State. And then they've got funding from National Science Foundation, a bunch of other places. Um, U.S. Geological Survey, NASA's involved. So they're collecting this from a lot of different places, I think. And I have not drilled down into where. So it says here the live bird maps are made by U.S. Weather Surveillance yes. Radar Network. Oh. Yeah, so this is so, they, they use the Doppler radar for a lot of it. Okay, it had, yeah, yeah, it had to be something like that. Yeah. So according to this, at 8.40 p.m. last night over my county, Travis County, there were uh, one point uh, uh, one million six hundred eighty nine thousand two hundred birds in flight going <laughs> south at a speed of twenty one miles an hour at an altitude of two thousand feet. Yes, <laughs> amazing. All while you're sleeping. Yeah, well, eight forty. Cool. Yeah, it's a little early for me. But this is just the U.S. though, right? This is, it's only U.S. based. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. Sorry for the folks in other countries, but hey, you can see where the flyways are in the U.S. It's very cool. And I called this these data. This would, according to, yeah. uh, who was it, Chris? This might Chris. be this data. Right. I mean, no, I've, look, we've, we've had this discussion before. Yeah, I've it's plural it to me. Sorry. Uh, uh, I, we, we've looked it up, and the, the, the dictionary, as I recall, says it can be both singular and plural, but um, our, uh, our writer puts a little more definition on that. Yes. Cool. Very cool. All right, my pick, I wish Dixon were here because there's a new journal called oh, Nature Cities. I didn't know this. And it's all about cities, right? Which is what Dixon is all about. And um, I, I picked an article which is about the 15-minute city. All right, so there's this idea. I mean, that... we used to say Rome wasn't built in a day. Now we got 15-minute cities. What is this? <laughs> what it means is that in the best city, everything is 15 minute walk for you. You don't have to drive anywhere, right? To get your services, your goods, and so forth. And so this article defines that and has a website where you could look at the scores, the 15 minute scores for cities all around the world. Almost all cities are scored. The website yeah. is very cool. 
right? 15 minute city concert. And, you know, not, in fact, in the US, probably most cities are not 15 minute no, cities. Uh, the, there are no blue dots on this website in the US. They're all either right. orange or red. There is Toronto. Yeah. I noticed that. I saw yeah. a blue dot over North America and zoomed in on that, and it was Toronto. Yep. But, um, yeah, the average, t- most cities in the U.S. look to be 27 to 30 minutes <laughs> to get somewhere. Germany's thought- loaded with 15-minute cities. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Central yep. Europe's doing great. But I, I like the, that idea that you could just live somewhere, not have a car, and you just- Absolutely. You walk wherever you go. Anyway, it's a cool article, and I like the idea of Nature City's journal to yeah. study the, the modern city. That's really cool. Modern and old cities. See what we can learn from it. Actually, New okay. York New York scores a little better. It's sort of uh, a light orange. It's looking like, uh, oh, I can actually click on that dot. Yeah, you can click on it. Yeah, New York is orange. It's... Uh, Mm. Oh, and then, oh, oh, wow. So if you click on that dot, you get a close-up of New York. Yes. Very interesting because uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn and a little bit out the island are blue. Yeah. Okay, and everything surrounding it is red. Makes perfect sense. Yep. And then they they show you the different colors, how many minutes, average accessibility on foot, you know, Mm -hmm. zero to two minutes, 12 to 14 minutes, and then. When it gets red, it's above eight, 16 to 18 minutes. And you can compare a bike as well. Yeah. Very anyway, cool. I like this concept, the 15-minute city. Yeah, really cool. I, I, I really like this. I can't, you know, where I'm living, I, I, even getting somewhere uh, on a bike is a hassle. But there are parts of Austin that are that There are, are like parts this. of, if you're downtown Austin, Austin is supposed to be a very bike-friendly city, and I think that's true. Yeah. That's if you live downtown i'm in the burbs we have two listener picks one is from tom who writes dear twiv team at this website you can vote for the fattest bear of the year (laughs) some of the largest brown bears on earth make their home at brooks river in katmai national park alaska brown bears get fat to survive and (laughs) fat bear week is an annual tournament celebrating their success in preparation for winter hibernation. It gives a link to that. You can also see bears hunting for salmon on this live stream. (laughs) Live stream. Got cams that show bears hunting for salmon. Let's see. Yeah. Well, there's just a waterfall there. There's no bear there right now. I guess you have to wait. uh, It looks like I can... uh, They got this guy, 909 Jr., uh, I selected him, but because uh, but I haven't voted for him. Oh, there's a bear, yeah. Interesting. Anyway, that's so cool. Tom from Pasadena and John writes: Cell Walk lets you spin a model of a cell around. It's currently free, and the tour looks excellent. Find it on the Apple App Store under Cell Walk. Beautiful cell biology. Uh, developer Timothy Davis. Cool. Uh, it looks like it uses a lot of these. Uh, What's the guy's name? Good Cell or something like that? A lot of his illustrations. I tried yes. to download the app, but my phone's too old. It's, those are Good Cell drawings. You're right. Yep. Ooh, I have to get that on my phone. Very yeah, cool. absolutely. Thank you, John. I got to get it. It's my final excuse to get a new phone. <laughs> to be able to run Cell Walk. Yeah. <laughs> That's Twiv1155. Show notes, microbe.tv slash Twiv. Questions, comments, picks. We'd, we'd love to get your questions, comments, and picks. Twiv at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy these programs, please consider supporting us financially. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. AlanDove.com. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. This is uh, really fun. I really have a good time with you guys. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Jolene for the timestamps, and 
Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We will be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Thank you.